Okay, we're gonna come down the home stretch. So, a good friend of mine, who was actually up here not too long ago, but we're gonna have a little bit more of a casual chat. Stani, you wanna come uh, join me on stage here? So, Stani, the founder of Abe, we all know him, we all love him. Uh, why don't you hang out right here? Oh, we have an empty fridge here. We have an empty fridge. I think, uh, yeah, oh well. There should be beer at this time of night, right? We do have Happy custom. Friday evening. Say that again? Happy Friday evening. <laughs> yeah, Friday. So it's 8 o'clock on Friday, and y'all are sitting here watching us? <laughs> Come on, Colorado fun. Is anybody going to go to Eat Dance tonight, or maybe a Spork Whale VIP party? No? Going to hack. They're maybe gonna hack. Should, They're going to build. Maybe we should do a surprise draw of it. What do you all think? <laughs> maybe. We should. I'll tell you what. I'm going to tweet right now. Uh-oh. Okay. Little alpha. So my handle is at PallerJohn. Retweet, like, follow, to get a, if you leak, like, retweet, and follow, I'm going to pick somebody who does all of those things to get a free Sporkwell upgrade. So I'm going to do this right now, okay? So come to at John and do that. Get a chance at a free spork whale upgrade. Now, if you don't know what that means, spork whale is our version of VIP. We got rid of that name because we don't really like it because it doesn't fit you know, the concept of contribution. Yeah, you could buy a spork whale pass if you want, but a lot of our spork whale holders are actually contributors from many years past. So you can stake 250,000 Spork tokens and get a free pass every year. So you don't have to like, you know, you don't have to like actually put money out. It's more of an investment. Uh, okay, here we go. Tweet. Now you have to be here. I get people on live stream. Hey, can I come down and get that pass? I'm like, no, dude, you got to be here. So I'm going to pick somebody at the end. So I'm going to DM you and then we can arrange to get you your pass, okay? So do that right now. At Power John, I just tweeted, like, follow, retweet. Got it? So we're gonna talk about bear markets. You know, bear market. Bear markets, I mean, we, supposedly we're in a bear. So let's start yeah. there. What's a bear to you? Well, it's, bear to me is, um, I think kind of like a, a state where there's less noise, um, you know, less overexcitement, less um, relatives calling you and asking what uh, crypto to buy tomorrow or today, um, you know, and um, getting messages from uh, Facebook from people you haven't seen for uh, 20 years <laughs> and, and asking, like, um, how to get into crypto. Um, I think bear market is a state where... Um, you have people in the space that are really interested in pushing the uh, space and innovation uh, forward. And I like to call that, you know, there's, there's a bull market, there's bear market, uh, but after, you know, the bear market turns into a, a builder market. And I think that's where we are at this point. So we have a space at the moment where um, you have people who believe in the technology, are excited about um, what kind of opportunities it can bring, um, and also are here for the very long run. And I think that's where a lot of uh, most um, valuable input and ideas are are created. Yeah, it's interesting because um, ETH Denver has happened, I would say, out of now this being the number sixth one that we've done, only two of them were in bull markets. And the fascinating thing is, we end up with so much better projects in the, bull, in the bear markets. Yeah. 
it's really, there's like a, an inverse correlation, right? Like last year was a bull market and the pro there was a lot of really great projects, but for 13,000 people, the signal was down actually from what we've seen before in bear markets. What do you, what do you, is this the, the Biddle market that you're talking about where it's? I think it is. I think, um, you know, I, I think there's great, when you have overexcitement in, in, in the space, in the industry, what happens very easily is that um, incremental ideas get a lot of traction, and you know, that's also a great thing, right? So you, know, you see a lot of um, exciting experimentations, but um, you know, when you have less demand, you actually have to start building more um, things that actually um, push the innovation far more further. Um, and, you know, it's, for me, especially during this kind of times, it really allows you also to talk to people who are uh, extremely excited about what you're building. And um, I know there's a lot of builders here, um, and, and thanks for actually taking time off uh, <laughs> of your hacking and, and coming here to listen to uh, us for a second. Um, so I'm trying to get, give some valuable, inf va valuable tips as well. So I think as building any product, it's, it's a lot about talking to the users and talking to your community and having a process of iterating the product feedback and implementing and uh, listening. Um, and, and during times like this, what's very helpful is that you usually have the users that really care about what you're building or it's somehow valuable for you. And that's, those are the users where you can get the, the most valuable feedback. And I still remember um, when we were building, um, even before Aave, our first uh, um, uh, protocol, Eatland, we, we still have today users that we were testing the um, protocol um, in its early stages and gave valuable feedback. And, and that's the reason why uh, we were able to iterate the, the Aave protocol to, to the state it is today. And I think that's something that uh, is very valuable uh, during times like this. So what it sounds like you're saying is it's just, it's, it, it's just better focus. There's less noise. There's more opportunity to really distill product, uh, refine product market fit, or even retool. So it, and it takes time. So you, know, you don't need to be successful like very quickly. Like, there, there's actually more time to um, iterate your your uh, product and and whatever you're building, and and, and that's very important because um, I, there is there isn't really overnight successes, right? So it, it takes a couple of years or even more to get into um, decent adoption or get a decent user base that helps you to build build a product further. So everybody knows that you work on a lot of various things, you've got a lot of cool projects going on, like what, what's your, what are you working on right now? What's the, what's the bear market interests that you've got? Yeah, there's a couple of things that I'm super excited about at, at Aave. So uh, first, um, we've been able to gather people in our team that are, that are excited about, um, you know, think about Web3 and, and the internet as a, as a whole. So how we um, how we can add decentralization, but at the same time, you know, how we can build an internet, you know, which benefits everyone um, and provides equal opportunity in finance and social participation. Um, on the other side, mostly we're focusing uh, on the Go stablecoin. Um, so that's a big project for our team. On the um, uh, Lens side, uh, we've been building Lens protocol, which where the Aave protocol provides um, equal access to financial opportunity across globally into transparent markets. Um, the Lens protocol provides access to ownership of your online presence. So we all know that you know, there's 5 billion users online um, and almost equal amount of social media users. But we don't really have a um, ownership of our presence online. Um, and what we're trying to do in, with Lens Protocol is that we're trying to bring the ownership of your online presence and the audiences you create and the connections you make um, to you. And that has been our focus point in creating this kind of like a social layer um, uh, over blockchain. What, 
What are builders going to build this weekend? What, I mean, you and I have talked about use cases and other things that we don't even have time to build. You know, that's one of the fun things about these events, right? Because you get a whole bunch of people together where it's like, you never know what you're going to see. If you wanted to see one thing that could come out of this weekend, what would it be? I would like to see something. Um, I mean, everyone pro probably has an idea. You know, there's there still people that don't have, and that's okay. Um, you know, you, you, at the end of the day, it's an experience for you. So you are the builders. You know, you have to decide what's exciting for you um, and what's fun because you know it's it's 48 hours. You you want to make most out of it, but also you want want to have a, a good and memorable um, experience. I would like to see things, especially on the social side, um, seeing some interesting um, algorithms being built that actually are benefiting the users. So on the social media, you know, we always are relying on the platform's way of creating algorithms, um, feeds. Um, but I think there's many alternative ways to create more transparent and public um, algorithms. And that's a very exciting thing for me to see. Um, on the DeFi side, I would like to see more payment applications, um, and mainly for the reason that um, if you think about like the, the narrative of, of uh, the blockchain, you know, Bitcoin was there to solve the idea of you know peer-to-peer -peer value transfers um, and store of value. Um, and when we look at the uh, DeFi ecosystem today, uh, we have a very efficient way of um, exchanging value, um, earning yield, um, borrowing funds against your cryptographic assets, um, interest rate swaps uh, for virtuals and, and all that other DJ and stuff. But what we don't really have at the moment is a good payment infrastructure um, and see payment applications. And today we're here, there's you know, 20,000, 25,000 uh, uh, folks here. Um, you know, and we could actually start using um, stable coins to, to pay for things and, and overall um, you know, replace the current internet infrastructure uh, that we have now with blockchain base, which brings transparency. But there's, there's definitely things that um, we, um, we need to build better uh, to actually um, get payments into more uh, adoption. No, 100%. I, I think I've actually seen a few projects that are actually doing that. They're working on it this weekend. It'd be cool to see what they do on Sunday. So backstage, we were talking about my day job, Opolis, and you asked me what's new. And I told you you had to wait, because I was going to tell you. What is Opolis? Well, Opolis is a decentralized employment platform. Does anybody know what Opolis is? Woo! Do we have any Opolis members here? We do, cool. So Opolis enables independent workers to have the benefits of large-scale employment without giving up their independence. Self-sovereign employment. Sound cool? We all talk about self-sovereign data, self-sovereign identity, but the one use case that is core to every person's experience, I talked about the future of work, this is why I care about this stuff, is employment. And the existing frameworks are incredibly paternalistic, hierarchical, and controlling. It's not really the fluid, sort of dynamic future of DAOs and having self-sovereign ind independence. So Opolis is powering that. So if you don't know, now you know. Uh, but I'm actually going to show you what's new. Yeah, I, I want to see. Let's see it. Let's see it. In a time not too distant, the ethereal galaxy is under attack. The future of self-sovereignty is in danger. Yet, a refuge emerges. Megalopolis. Megalopolis. Home to the workforce, Megalopolis is a galactic community of communities who value freedom and flexibility in their lives. A bastion of freedom, inhabitants of Megalopolis are free to work from where, with whom, and how much they choose. A lifestyle of choice that hasn't existed for most in the ethereal galaxy for many epochs. Choice and freedom are the disdain of the corporati, and their paternalistic overlord, Extractor. Extractor, corporate. Extractor's exploitative armies seek to destroy the freedom and joy of Megalopolis, the workforce, and anyone who values individuality and independence. But there is hope. 
A powerful coalition has formed between many ethereal galaxy communities. The Order of the Opus Quay has convened. As the Grand Stewards of Megalopolis, the Opus Quay have been hand-selected by their communities to protect the freedoms of the independent worker. Self-sovereignty is secure. For now. What do y'all think? So, yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? That's pretty interesting. So, um, what do you think, um, what are the most exciting things um, you're thinking about how the future of work will occur? Like, what are the, um, what are the things that excites you at the moment? How we, how we as, um, not just we builders, but the whole, uh, humanity uh, is going to change in how they work in the future. Yeah, I think work is going to fundamentally change in ways that I think most people haven't even considered. I think the biggest thing that's going to really accelerate it is the opportunity for new economic engines. So play to earn, work to earn, contribute to earn, atten attention to earn. Once people have a choice to opt out of traditional systems, or even opt into new systems where they didn't have opportunity previously in say underserved communities or globally, it's gonna change everything. But the problem is, if you know anything about regulators and compliance, they actually don't like dealing with independent workers. Now there's only one reason why, does anybody know? Taxes. It is a pain in the ass for them to get you to pay your taxes. Now. We can argue about taxes and whether or not that's even a thing we should be doing, but let's just say we got to do it or we're going to go to jail, right? So if you don't pay your taxes, it's called tax evasion in the United States, and it's kind of one of those things that you don't want to get caught up in. So how do you actually create a system that allows people to have this high-frequency choice where I can contribute to DAOs, I can be uh, a DeFi contributor, I can trade NFTs, I can... Uh, play to earn, I can build interesting things. Like, what, what's gonna help me actually manage all that? So what Opolis really does is, is normalize this new future. So the new future is what excites me, but we have to build better tool sets and infrastructures to help people have these choices, because right now the frameworks that we have, and the standard is corporate-based employment, and it doesn't matter if you're here or in, in, in Europe, or even throughout the world, we've copied this model, the corporate structure, that subjugates you to a, a certain relational dynamic. That relational dynamic is gonna move from paternalistic to mutualistic. And once it does that, where the, the formerly known as employer no longer has to take on all of this risk, which creates these behaviors, these HR behaviors, we can now have this freedom and flexibility and this choice that we haven't had before and enable people to really live much more fluid lives, much more dynamic lives, much more um, interesting work lives because let's be honest, a lot of people sitting in the typical structure aren't that happy. They do it because they have to. So we give people the choice to opt into a new future and building those tool sets is what excites me. So whether it's governance frameworks or social frameworks that actually have interesting economic engines or even boring compliance platforms that have cool cartoon characters. Like, uh, I mean, the reason why we did this is, let's be honest, payroll, benefits, taxes, and employment stuff sucks. Nobody gives a shit about that. Like, it's not cool, fun crypto stuff or AI generative art environments. It's not anything like that. It's boring, nobody wants to do it, but it's necessary. So we're trying to make it more relatable, more accessible to say, look, the self-sovereign future matters. It matters a lot. It matters to me. I get, I get the good fortune of living it in a lot of ways because I've built it for myself and for a lot of people around. And now we're here to spread it and to build it systemically to where it's immutable and so big and powerful that nobody could possibly mess with it. I think also that, um, you know, when we think about topics like future of work, like our work is changing all the time and it has, it has been um, changing radically since COVID. So 
I think there should be systems where you can. I like the idea of, of opting in and opting out. That you can actually, choice, choice exactly, and that's that's what Web3 is about. You know, choice. it's not about decentralization. To be honest, it's not about centralization, CFI, DeFi. You know, it's about having a base layer. You know, that you know anyone can access and go for. But it's it's basically freedom of choice. You can choose. You know, interact directly with decentralized protocols, or you can choose to um, use something in between that provides you. Uh, value or better experience, for example. No, 100%. I mean, we we talk about this on our team all the time. Like, in some ways, we're kind of poking the bear. You know, proverb that you know, compliance is not an area that's for the faint of heart, right? So we deal with a lot of interesting things, a lot of questionable, like how do you deal with things? But at the end of the day, choice is so important to where we're going with all of this tech, all of these systems, all of these new opportunities that we build, experiences that we build, and it's it's really the cornerstone of ETH Denver. You all heard me talk about this last night. Like, we don't charge for to be here. We don't require that you do anything. Why? Because it's all based on choice. You're here by choice. Well, you're not here because you have to be, or you paid for a ticket, you feel obligated, you chose to be here. And we want that. We think it's fundamental to the human experience to create, to build, and to ultimately usher in the right next chapter. Because there are alternatives that are much less optimistic. And interestingly, this is one of, like, this is a bear market where actually macroeconomics play a big role. So when you think about future of work, employment, um, a lot of things are changing now, you know, and it's, it's not just only, um, let's say, bear market in, in the crypto, but in the macroeconomic level. So it's actually a good time to think about um, the future of work, um, you know, how you can actually rebuild and redesign the way we um, work in the society, how finance is participating to that, how social is related to that, um, and, and how all these uh, blocks and pieces or like Legos uh, could fit. So. And you're here, so you have the opportunity to actually innovate on this all cool stuff and a bunch of other things that are uh, you can, you can hack, hack on during this hackathon. So one thing that I think is interesting, 6% of our applicants are UX focused. So how do we solve, how do we solve UX? And that, I mean, I, I know you're not a UX expert. Maybe you have some thoughts on it. Maybe you, you know, know how we can answer that. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, I mean, uh, US is interesting because um, US as a place of innovation is extremely fascinating. So there's so much innovation um, in, in US and so many clusters of, of um, uh, innovation hubs that, um, you know, it. You, you can't really find the same level uh, elsewhere. The, the challenge in crypto is that, you know, when, when you don't have necessarily clear rules, you know, it's um, hard to innovate. And, and that's, but that's always the case with tech. So in one way I want to say is that, you know, if you are innovating um, in an unclear in a, an environment, it also means at the same time, um, you know, that you're building something new. You are in the new waters, and with every technology, you know you have always, um, you know, a set of people that are seeing the, the technology in a positive way, and some that are seeing it as a threat. You know, if you go back in time and think about, for example, where the cars were invented, so there was actually laws that required uh, three people to be in a car, right? So the driver, a mechanic, because cars broke down all the time, and one person walking um, 50 meters in front of the car and waving red flags like this, right? And shouting that a car is coming, an automobile is coming. Um, and that lasted for roughly 30 years. And that was in UK and, and US, for example. So that's just one example. You know, cryptography had its own battles. Um, we had battles with, with the internet. And, and, and it's the people that actually legitimize the technology a lot of the um, adoption of, for example, World Wide Web and the internet happened also through universities um, and use cases such as research and, you know, 
it's, it's all up to the people who actually are behind of the technology and what we're trying to achieve. And the more positive use cases we can actually build, the more adoption we get and also public approval. And I think the Ethereum moving from proof of work to proof of stake is a good example where you know, the uh, Ethereum blockchain produces less um, emissions, which is actually also gets more approval in a more global level. And I think those kind of th things move the needle in a more like a societal um, um, sphere. So uh, it was kind of disappointing when I found out that Vitalik couldn't be here in person. You know, we love him. He's been here almost every year. He is uh, obviously the, the, the spirit animal that inspired the spirit animal of the Buffacorn in some ways. And um, it was really kind of a sad thing. I mean, we, there's, he's got a lot to say. It seems like yeah. things like payments and the things we're talking UX, about. UX, user experience. Yeah. So, gosh, wouldn't it be cool if maybe we could have a chat with him right now? Yeah, but how? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we just think it. Wouldn't it be cool? You guys want to talk to Vitalik? Should we get him here? What do you think? Oh, oh my wow. God, look at that. Oh. You ask and you shall receive. Vitalik? Yeah, I get to talk to people through the cyber. Amazing. Can you hear us okay? I can. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Give it up for the AV guys. This was not exactly the easiest thing to do. So Vitalik, uh, you know, recently you've been talking a lot about things like payments and UX and, you know, adoption type of things. Um, you know, Stani and I have been talking about building in a bear market and, you know, uh, we'd like to hear a little bit more about your uh, thoughts on, say, UX and like, what, what are the next steps for this? Do you, do you think you got it in you to give us a little bit there? Uh, yeah, um, so I think uh, just to start off kind of the the general big fr framework that I have for what we need to be doing over the next 10 years, right, is basically that the uh, 2010s were a decade of uh, very early stage discovery, lots of theory, lots of very base level infrastructure, and uh, applications, you know, largely focused on basically existing crypto geeks and people who uh, really wants to early adopt stuff. And the next 10 years are going to have to be in the decade of like actually getting to, um, you know, real use cases that are actually directly, yeah, you know, usable in very concrete ways by, yeah, you know, millions of people, including people who have, uh, uh, who would otherwise have nothing to do with crypto. Um, and, you know, people like this exist in all parts of the world, right? Like practical need for crypto is uh, in a lot of cases stronger in places like say, yeah, you know, Latin America and Africa and uh, Southeast Asia than it is in uh, places like the US, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, you, yes, you can get a uh, deep platform that's censored in those things, but at the same time, you know, the kind of the average case is that, um, you know, there are banking systems and, that, and they do kind of work. But in a lot of these other places, like even that is, is just totally not true, right? And a lot of those regions depend a lot more on international transactions, whether it's for business or remittances or other things. And, uh, you know, traditional ways of doing things uh, across countries just don't even exist yet, right? So there's uh, much more severe international problems, um, much more severe problems with local centralized infrastructure and uh, just all of these things, right? Um, but at the same time, I think it's important to acknowledge that, uh, you know, crypto in its current form still has a lot of problems um, it, with regard to its ability to be used in these places, right? And then, like, later on, I'll talk in a bit more detail about this. But uh, they basically, uh, you know, lots of people in Latin America use... Uh, you know, cryptocurrency, including Ethereum, and how do lots of them use it? Well, often the answer is Binance, right? And, you know, on the one hand, I think, um, you know, we have to be yeah, appreciative to Binance for just being there when, uh, you know, none of the other big uh, global providers um, are in many cases, and just providing them some way that people can go and actually use things. But at the same time, I think it's, uh, 
also important for the ecosystem to move toward more decentralization. And, um, you know, we have to ask the question of, uh, like, how can we yeah, actually improve the yeah, decentralization or how can we actually improve the yeah, user experience of the decentralized approaches and like actually yeah, get the decentralized approaches to the point where people are willing to like really yeah, you know use them and uh, not get scared as soon as there is a yeah, the, the first time that they see a problem. So, uh, Vitalik. You got mm -hmm. about 15 more minutes of stuff for us, right? So I think Stani and I, I are going to... I do indeed, yeah. Yeah, we're going to step off the stage, and I just wanted to say um, mm -hmm. the Bufficorn misses you and demands a hug the next time you come, okay? I was instructed to tell you this, so I'm sorry. I will. Next time I come, I am happy to hug the uh, Buffercorn and, uh, and and even any friends that the Buffercorn um, ends up uh, making well, by the time you know, the next one comes around. So. I, we will hold you to that. So thank you so much for spending your really early, early morning with us. And uh, we'll give the stage to you. And then after he's done, that's a wrap. So um, take it away, Vitalik. Sounds good. Okay. Um, let's see what we can do there. Um, do you guys uh, do you guys see the sharing? Testing. One, two, three. Just want to confirm that people are seeing the slides and hearing me and, and hearing me. Seeing me would be nice, but a bit less important. Yes, we are seeing this. Amazing. Okay. So concrete challenges in uh, user experience, right? So I think as I kind of said in my introduction, you know, lots of people have a clear and deep need for Ethereum-based applications today. These tools that we're building are, um, you know, tools that are not just um, providing an uh, opportunity for people to, um, you know, have fun and uh, uh, kind of express their love for freedom, and, for freedom and decentralization as ideals, and uh, make money and lose money and all of those things. These are things that, like, lots of people, even people who have no attachments to these principles, like, actually, just really need to use. And lots of people are using them. Sometimes these applications are currency, but uh, other times it's also more complicated things that people get interested in. Like, uh, I was recently on a trip to Africa, and I was actually surprised by like, just how much interest there was in the concept of DAOs. Like, the concept of local groups coming together and creating some kind of circle of trust is like something that is uh, already native uh, to a lot of uh, uh, you know, cultures there, which is... Uh, you know, I thought was something fascinating, right? And, uh, you know, today it's uh, payments. I uh, expect that, um, you know, ZK-based thing things are things that people are going to start having a need for in the future, even the whole Ethereum identity ecosystem at some point. But the problem today is that a lot of people are accessing these things using centralized services. And centralized services are convenient. They do the job. Uh, but ultimately, centralized services, in my view, especially what at like centralized services in these really core positions of control, where they're not just um, you know on the side providing a useful tool like either scan, but they're like really yeah running the experience. Like they're they're ultimately not the yeah end goal of crypto, right? And uh, I think in general, um, you know, we yeah we know what the problems with uh, centralized services at their worst can be, right? Uh, so. Uh, I'm sure people have seen, um, you know, this guy. I yeah. I mean, I saw on uh, on the Twitter that there is apparently even some toilet paper of him. Uh, but uh, you know, people trusted a guy. The guy because the guy looks professional, and uh, the guy said the right things. The guy yeah, virtue signaled his love of social impact. The guy even virtue signaled the version of the social impact uh, meme that appeals to nerds, and. Uh, you know, he went on panels with uh, lovely chaps like Bill Clinton. Um, and, uh, you know, it turns out that he had double spending relations with people's assets. Now, this is, um, 
I think was correctly identified by uh, a lot of people as uh, really showing the risk of uh, just being okay with uh, central relying on centralized services at a large scale, right? But uh, you know, the challenge is that uh, if we want people to actually use decentral uh, decentralized services, we have to like really address the challenges and understand why they uh, are not winning right now. And the two re big reasons are basically one fee is two user experience. Now, fees we're not going to talk about because uh, fees are being solved by layer two scaling and rollups and optimism, Arbitrum, Polygon, Scroll, Tyco, Starknet, ZK Sync, and uh, that whole ecosystem, and uh, EIP 4844 and dank sharding and proto dank sharding. And we've kind of heard that whole story. User experience is the other really big and important piece. Uh, so, uh, a bit of a personal story. So, a year ago, I uh, went to a uh, coffee shop in Argentina, right? And uh, the coffee shop accepted um, or ha had an owner who recognized me and um, you know had a crypto wallet. And so uh, we uh, uh, you know asked if we could uh, pay in ETH, and we did. And um, you know it was a really lovely interaction, and um, you know we all enjoyed it. But at the same time, some of the details of like actually attempting to make the transaction from my side, um, you know, showed what some of the issues are, right? So uh, fees were high, right? So uh, transaction fee is just to send some ETH while I was uh, on this visit in 2021. We're somewhere between $1 and $5. In 2022, they dropped down to below $1. Now they're finally picking back up again. And, um, you know, we're, I think, cheering that our ultrasound money is ultrasound again, but we also have to remember that the uh, flip side of that is that it is, again, more expensive to send transactions. Uh, transactions uh, take a long time to get accepted on chain. Once you click send, you have to wait a long time for it to get accepted. And once a transaction is accepted, there's even problems on the uh, merchant side or the uh, application of the recipient. Services often don't see the transaction immediately. Like even when they have a facility to, uh, show transactions that are unconfirmed, they often don't even show it unconfirmed for some amount of time. So uh, sub UX uh, hurdles there. Now, AP1559, um, it is uh, generally viewed as an efficiency improvement reform and as the thing that created the whole ultra ultrasound money thing. But I think it's important to remember one of the ways in which the efficiency uh, improving side of it manifests, which is that it massively reduces waiting times for people trying to send transactions, right? Um, so uh, blue here is before AP1559. Yeah, um, this yellow orangey color is after AP1559. Average waiting times decreased by a lot. And uh, both like in theory and in my own personal observation, the merge actually decreased waiting times even more, right? By making block times more stable, it's reduced the average amount of time you have to wait until the next block from 13 seconds to six seconds. And uh, rollups with pre-confirmations uh, could potentially make you know, some kind of initial confirmation of uh, payments pretty close to instant. So lots of things actually happening on the uh, transaction accepting front, right? But this is not the only problem. So back in uh, 2013, uh, when uh, I was visiting San Francisco for the first time, and uh, this was around the time when I was writing the Ethereum white paper. And uh, so at the time, Ethereum did not exist yet. And so I yeah, was um, you know, excited about Bitcoin, and I yeah, remember that uh, I was told that there was this lovely sushi place beside the Internet Archive that accepted uh, Bitcoin for payments. So I went there, and uh, I paid in Bitcoin. But the problem is that when I tried to make the payment, my Internet did not work, right? And after my Internet did not work, I yeah, basically kept trying, kept trying, and eventually I had to... Um, basically walk over about 50 meters to get closer to the Internet Archive, hop onto the Internet Archive's Wi-Fi, and uh, send the uh, transaction. Consumer Internet is not 100% reliable. My Internet on, like, literally my smartphone is not 100% reliable. Like, there are just times when it stops working for some number of seconds, and this is just a thing that happens to people. Um, so how do we solve this, right? What happens when a consumer tries to pay in person and uh, uh, the internet doesn't work? So option one is, uh, you know, may merchants could just have Wi-Fi and consumers can connect to the merchant Wi-Fi, but this is kind of slow and cumbersome when you have to like figure things out and fiddle with passwords. These days you can scan QR codes, uh, which is a bit better, but even still. And then 
there is my preferred solution to this, which is uh, like this is one of these things that uh, feels like something that like would make an Apple engine uh, UI designer scream because it's just because it just feels ugly and it's not so weak. But like in my opinion, it's just obviously the correct thing to do. And uh, you know, it doesn't try to be optimal. It tries to be robust and it tries to just provide clear solutions even when things fail. Basically. Your wallet as a sender, it should auto detect if your connection to the internet fails. And if that happens, it should show the signed transaction as a QR code. And then the merchant can just scan the QR code. And on the merchant side, the merchant's app can automatically broadcast the transaction. And the merchant can check the transaction locally. And if the merchant accepts it, then, uh, you know, of course, the yeah, merchant would be able to just uh, immediately ex uh, accept the payment. So, if we do this, right, then we don't have to rely on cons necessarily consumers having great internet. You have a backup option only relying on the merchants having great internet. And if you do this, then um, you know merchants are more likely to have reliable internet than consumers are. They are businesses. They are um, you know in one place. They have Wi-Fi and all and the, and, and all of these things. And like this would considerably improve the user experience for people trying to make payments, right? So I will, like I would just love to see more wallets just automatically you know have this as an option. Moving beyond payments, uh, social recovery and multi-six. So I have been a big fan of social recovery for years. I've been a big fan of multi-six for years. Literally, my money is on the line, right? Like my, yeah, mm, the bulk of my own ETH is in a multi-sig wallet. And that has, um, you know, most of the keys controlled by, yeah, you know, other people who are guardians. And I think things like this are a necessary innovation in account security for regular users, right? Regular users are not going to be able to do a good job with 12 word passphrases and not accidentally forgetting them or losing them. Again, I remember when I was uh, still um, not yet using my multisig and I created a clever scheme where I basically yeah, gen randomly generated two numbers that added up to my private key and uh, you know held them in different places and uh, separately had a yeah, backup and like even then i was almost like scared every day that something would happen to um you know one and then i would uh, i would have to figure out whether or not the backup works and um, you know maybe the backup would not work either right and and like i personally just feel so much better with a multi-sig um so i think this stuff is uh necessary innovation in account security go beyond trying to rely on just yourself for regular users and it needs to be done well, right? So uh, one of the yeah, nightmare stories that I had is, uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, this was uh, before COVID, I was uh, beta testing a social recovery wallet that was not using the smart contract-based approach. They were using the approach where they yeah, basically secret shared your private key and they sent a shard of your private key to your guardians. But the problem is that this required your guardians to install a custom app and uh, they have a communication channel directly with them. And that communication channel ended up frequently breaking. And then when, as the guardians just lived their lives, because they used their app for this only this one purpose, they would inevitably end up forgetting it when they switched phones. And um, you know, eventually I, I ended up losing some of my money, right? So uh, any, uh, like my, my strong view is that any of these recovery things like should not require guardians to have custom infrastructure. They should just be based on guardians existing uh, ETH addresses. Now, remaining questions. One is how do we help non-Ethereum users safely be guardians? So uh, what if you know you want your mom to be a guardian, but she doesn't have an Ethereum account yet? Um, still an unsolved UX problem. Maybe for that particular case, you want to create an option to rely and piggyback off of something other than an Ethereum account. But then the question is like, what would it be? And uh, you know, one option might be that if you have like three non-Ethereum users as guardians, then uh, one of them guards by having some like a private key stored on um, you know iCloud, another one guardians by having their private key stored on you know like ten cent cloud, and a third on um, you know something that's uh, geopolitically independent from both of those, and so that way you get to be yeah, you know both um, have. And it's protection against anyone, something happening to any one individual guardian, but also, um, you know, you're not actually relying on like any one specific uh, one of these uh, cloud providers to be safe, right? And you have, I mean, your, your uh, company diversification and jurisdictional diversification and all of these things. 
Um, privacy, this is a big one. Um, uh, some of the people that I've talked to when I suggested to them that they use multi-sig, they yeah, responded with the critique that they did not want guardians to know what assets they have, right? And this is just an important financial privacy thing for them. This uh, can be solved. There are ways to set up a multi-sig or a social recovery wallet in such a way that the guardians don't actually know what they're guarding. And this can and should be done. Um, I mean, there is an easy version where they don't know until they actually have to, um, you know, recover something. But there is a harder version where they yeah, don't know even after that. And then the last thing is just like social norms around authentication, right? Which is, um, you know, if you uh, ask someone to be your guardian, they need to know that if you ask them to uh, help you send a transaction or recover your key, they should not accept immediately just because you sent them a Telegram message. Because, well, if that's the norm, then someone could steal your wallet just by hacking your Telegram, right? So, uh, you know, the education part of this is that they need to remember that they have to ask you something that only you would know, right? Like one simple thing is just like to ask them about a specific detail of the you know, last time that you uh, did something together in person. So um, social recovery and multisigs. Um, privacy is another big one. Privacy is still important. Privacy is still a human right, and privacy continues to be a key protection against uh, powerful institutions at their worst. And privacy is something that modern networks technology does not have by default. And so we have to we try harder. Now, um, I mean, uh, recently made this tweet and uh, you know, I'm announcing that there's going to be private this uh, privacy polls v0, the sequel to Trade Cash, which I think is great, right? But at the same time, one of the things that's important to really make sure with privacy is that it's very important to make the privacy actually be private, even in the hands of people who are not perfect and who sometimes screw it up, right? Like, uh, in some, like, I mean, him, um, himself, just to give an example, you know, he's also been, uh, you know, very supportive of uh, Iranians, uh, fi you know, fighting against their authoritarian government. And, uh, you know, I think it's a yeah, great and uh, on honorable cause. And, uh, you know, absolutely, yeah, you know, stands with all the women who, uh, who, who wants to have their life and freedom there. Um, but, uh, at the same time, it's, uh, you know, if you think about the intersection of these two things, like, this gets into the point where we're using privacy technology to like do some real serious shit, right? This is not kind of idealistically LARPing privacy. This is like actually using privacy to protect people. And so we don't just need to think about privacy as uh, something that where we just think about it in the abstract and we know we have zero knowledge proofs and all of these things, but you know, really need to think about like really what is the concrete privacy? What is the threat model? Are we sure that people are uh, who are use um you know cryptocurrency and zcash and various privacy tools are that are important are not actually yeah, you know accidentally going to uh, lose their privacy because they just accidentally do one thing that they shouldn't and like i am like i personally yeah if actually yeah accidentally yeah broke my privacy by yeah you know f fumbling around with a tornado the wrong way about a year and a half ago so uh m you know this is uh, an important thing to guard against Right, it's like easy to accidentally leak data, even if you're using fancy tech. One of my views is that I think uh, more wallets probably need to think about this more explicitly. Like you want better separation of profiles in wallets, probably more def defaults toward one wallet per application. Um, one other idea I, I, yeah, I can talked about recently yeah, in my blog is uh, stealth addresses, and stealth addresses is something that like would really need some deep wallet level integration. Wallets should have more direct uh, integration of privacy tools. Um, another thing is just better defenses against the off-chain um, side of tracking. And finally, yeah, you know, better defenses against Ethereum node providers seeing everything, right? And uh, you know, these are things that I think we can improve on, but these are things that we actually should improve on a lot. So, you know, conclusions again, right? So uh, 2010s were the decade of theory. Uh, 2020s are the decade of uh, building out large-scale adoption. And there's important uh, obstacles to this. And um, fees are a really big one, but user experience is also a really big one. And, um, you know, it's important to, like, actually yeah, keep working on these uh, really specific user experience issues. And to finish off with one sociological note, I think yeah, this all shows one of the reasons why it's important for core developers, wallet developers, client developers, application developers to get out more, right? Like, 
if your city has a place that accepts, uh, you know, payment for ETH in person, like actually go to it and like actually support them, um, you know, pay for something with ETH in person, uh, pay for something with ETH online, um, you know, use your ENS name to do stuff like, you know, actually use um, all of these different uh, applications more once in a while. And, uh, you know, this will just, I think, give you a you know, better and much more uh, practical view of like, what really are the uh, the missing pieces that are annoying people? And um, you know, if you have friends, then um, you know, try to convince your friends to use Ethereum for um, you know, online and in person, um, you know, payments and other applications, and um, you know, see yeah, what kinds of uh, problems they encounter. Right. So uh, you know, hope I hope that over the next few years, this is uh, something that we uh, that we can do more of. Thank, thank you, Vitalik. We really appreciate you taking the time, my friend.